With that, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Nakama Goodman. So she survived a triple bombing attack in Jerusalem in 2001. Guys, a triple bombing attack. It's hard enough to survive one. Um, Nakama now works for um, Chabad and she works as the Friendship Circle Coordinator for Greater Fort Lauderdale. It's an organization. I have a daughter with special needs and Friendship Circle is one of the most important parts of our lives. So thank you for working with them. Um, and she helps bridge the gap between law enforcement and community. She brings families with special needs together and she helps to foster volunteerism and community. She was 17 when she survived the attack. And since then, she has found opportunities to volunteer and to make the world better. And she sits on a victim's advisory council um, for strength to strength. And she is involved in Mental Health Alliance um, in Florida, where she lives. Um, and she lives there with her husband and four children. And I think it's so amazing that so many victims choose to make the world better and do good and bring world, good into the world as the antidote to the hate that they experience. So thank you, Nakama, for coming to share with us. Thank you, Jody. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to be here today. Um, I wish that none of us had to be on a call like this and speaking about things like this, but I forgive, <laughs> forgive me, I'm also expecting and very emotional, as Sari can attest to. Um, <laughs> So I left Carl Springs, Florida, a little nothing town at 17 years old. I had just finished my junior year of high school, and I decided that high school was not working out for me at the time. Uh, it happens to be that Sari was my youth advisor in NCSY um, and one of the many people who guided my decision to go to Israel that year. Um, this was the beginning of, of the Intifada, and I was hearing things come out of Israel, the, the Sabara bombing that we all know of um, that happened in August of 2001. You know, I, I understood that things were happening in Israel, but I don't think I really understood what was going on. And I, and I don't know that my decisions would have been any different. Um, so I left to seminary with a couple of friends, which would have been my senior year in high school. I was a year younger than everyone else, but it was totally fine. Um, the night of my attack was December 1st, 2001. It was a Saturday night. I had a week's worth of laundry that I had let build up and decide that tonight is gonna to be the night that I deal with the laundry. Uh, across the hall was a friend of mine from home from Miami who had just broken up with someone she had been seeing over the course of the last year and she was really having a rough night. And so I knocked on her door. I tried to console her, tried to tell her all the things that we could, you know, talk about instead. And finally, I said to her, you know, it's early enough. We can still go out and have a nice night. The laundry can wait. The, the uh, washer and dryer was in the dorm anyway, so I could have done it when we got back. And I said to her, you know, let's go out. Let's go grab a cup of coffee and a bagel on a Saturday night. There was nothing special, nothing different going on. It was just two friends um, going out for a cup of coffee. So we hopped on a bus straight from our dorm, got in line uh, at the bagel shop, which was right off of Ben Yehuda and Yafo Street. And the bagel place was packed. It was a busy Saturday night. All of our friends from America were out on Ben Yehuda. Um, and I placed my order and Daniela placed her order. And we were getting shoved around the store. So we decided we would wait on the street corner until our order was ready. I, I, you know, the things that I remember from that day and the things that I block out, I can tell you what I ordered that night. I ordered an everything bagel with Munster cheese and pesto. And I was so looking forward to it. You know, I, I don't know. I might have had crackers in the dorm for lunch or something. Um, I, and the next thing I remember was the ground shaking. And thinking, this this must be what an earthquake feels like. You know, I grew up in Florida. We don't have earthquakes in Florida. And a fireball coming out of the oven at us. Now, Daniela, who is also from Miami, um, 
we didn't know how to comprehend what was going on. And suddenly there was silence. There was no sound that I can even describe it besides silence. You know, the sound after the glass shatters, before people react. I remember looking up at the sky thinking, what just happened? Um, and then a snap. And in that snap, all of a sudden, the whole picture comes together. People are running. People are screaming. You start to hear sirens. And you don't even, it's so hard to process in that moment of what you've just been through. I remember as I'm seeing red on the streets that someone had once said to me, you know, only rubberneckers stare at an accident because they want to see the gore. And it was such a conscious thought in my mind that day of, if I look at the street, I know what I'm going to see. I can't look down. No matter what, don't look down. So instead, I looked up. And when I looked up, there had been construction going on in the corner of Ben Yehuda. They had been building a giant circular paver of bricks. I don't know if it's still there, but it was on the very bottom. And I can't think of what the purpose of this giant circle is um, other than people to sit on. And as, as they had been doing the construction at night, when they would close the construction site, they had put up sheet metal in the shape of a triangle. So you had, you know, two pieces like this, one piece like this, and we had been standing at the bottom piece of it um, when the when the two suicide bombers had detonated themselves. The sheet metal was whole when we stepped into the bagel store. The sheet metal was not whole when we walked out. And you can see everything up the block. The ice cream store that had been on the corner had been demolished. And at that point, we hadn't known that there was two separate incidents at the same time. We just knew that there was a bomb and we had to get out of there. And as people were running in every direction, you don't know where to turn. You can't go up because there's no cars that way. And and you're literally in the blast zone. And behind you is now EMS and police and sirens. So in a moment when you're looking for safety, in a scenario like that, you really don't know what safety looks like. Um, and as Danielle and I are standing there, not knowing which way to run, a third friend of ours runs up to us. And uh, another friend from Miami who was getting together with another friend from Miami and he starts yelling at us, have you seen Shalom? And we said, no, you know, it was just the two of us out tonight. We didn't make plans to get together with anyone else. And he said, I was supposed to meet Shalom in the ice cream shop. I don't know where he is. I started my AMT training when I was back at home. I need to go find him. So we said, what, what do we do? And, and he looked at both of us. And he said, you have to get out of here because I can't go looking for someone if I'm still worried about you in the blast zone. At that point, I didn't realize we were still standing in the middle of the blast zone. Um, and as he went running in the other direction and Danielle and I decided to run towards EMS. And right across Ben Yehuda, there's a, a little no-name street that if you've ever walked the street of uh, of Jerusalem, you've passed it a million times. It's called Rough Cook. You would never know that it has a name because it's just a little alleyway. And Danielle and I stood on the corner of Rough Cook Street, leaning against an off-white station wagon, looked like a Subaru. And as we're standing there, packed like sardines, um, there's no buses running. There's no taxis running. There's no no way for us to get back to school. A police officer on the street corner starts run and starts screaming, run. No, we didn't even know where to run to at this point. We can't go forward. We can't go back. There's there's no there's no access to public transportation up the street, but he's screaming run. And as he's screaming run, we move off the car and got about 25, 30 feet when the car explodes. And that car was set to go off after EMS and first responders. It shows you the mindset of someone that's dealing with terrorism, that it's not just enough 
to impact the families, the individuals. I mean, who are you going after on a Saturday night in a bagel shop in an ice cream store? You know, th this isn't political. These these are people. Um, and now you're going after first responders, first responders who have an obligation to save the most wounded person first. Um, and, it, and it really puts things in, in perspective and, and mindset. I, uh, I ran with Daniela up the block and we found someone who lived in the city that our school was. And the two of us, along with 12 others, climbed into this four passenger car and were dumped outside of our dorm. And I don't remember even walking up the hill. That was such a painful walk up the hill from our dorm. There was, there was no stairs and we used to call it the hill. And if you had to go down the hill, it was always such a pain. And I don't remember climbing the hill that night. I do remember getting into my room and trying to call my friend Ezzy, who I had just seen, who after the third attack, I didn't see. And realizing our cell phones were still not working. Um, because whatever whatever device they had used for that third explosion probably had been detonated by a cell phone. So at this point, we didn't know who we had seen in the interim, if they had made it out. It wasn't until eight o'clock the next morning um, that we had heard from anyone. So I, I had spent that whole night, I had called my grandfather in the States uh, and my parents kept Shabbos. And at that point I wasn't able to let them know, but my greatest fear was that they would turn on the TV and hear about the explosion and not know if I was okay because my cell phone wasn't really working so well. So my grandfather had jumped in his car and gone to my parents' house. And by the time I spoke to my parents, I simply said to them, I'm okay. Um, I realize now that okay is a very relative term. I'm okay because I lived. I'm okay because I didn't walk away with shrapnel in my body that night. There's no part of me that was okay that night. Um, and it took me 10 years to, to really understand that I was not okay. Uh, I came back to the States three years later. Um, and I only came back to the States three years later because I was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I left Israel during this time, that I would never go back and that my feelings and, and fear that had built up that night would take such a stronghold that, that I had to stay. I had to be resilient. I had to push past it despite attack after attack after attack that was going on those years um, to the point that that recently I got together with my, my roommate for my third year. We had a little apartment in town. And she says, do you remember the morning we woke up and your bus exploded outside the window? And I said, um, I remember that my alarm hadn't gone off that morning. I actually was going to to school to do substance abuse counseling and and the thought process of hearing your bus explode outside of your house when you're so numb is um I guess I'm not going to school today, you know, which which I now realize is is the long lasting effects that trauma has on your life. Um, I came back to the States and four years later, got a job working for the Jewish agency, helping people make Aliyah to Israel, because I still strongly believe that the safest place for anyone to be is in Israel. Um, and not even putting together that for me, this was such a healing um, job that on a daily basis, I was able to send people and say, you know, you, you didn't, you didn't kill me. You didn't, you didn't do what you wanted. You didn't scare me. And not only didn't you scare me, you just made me stronger. And that's a lot of why I do what I do now. And I continue to work closely with law enforcement, thanking them because the truth is, as anyone in any of these situations can tell you, there's no time to say thank you in, in, in the midst of a crisis and a trauma. Um, and oftentimes after the fact, it's very hard to find those people. Uh, so I actively look for opportunities to do it. And the only way that I was able to climb out of my own hole 
which it took me six weeks to to come out of my dorm room again. Uh, thank God for good roommates who who brought me food and you know, I, are you okay? The school brought in trauma therapist, but I I was not at that point ready to talk to anyone. Um that the, this is the way things evolved. And I'm, I'm grateful for organizations like Strength to Strength and, and Sari, who uh, at 14 was able to, to guide me into a, a good place and who's uh, reconnected with me. I actually shared with uh, Sari on a retreat recently. I, I remember so vividly, I was sitting in my office at the Jewish Agency in Miami and I was having a conversation with Sari about something. And, and I don't remember what the conversation was about, and I said, no, Sari, you know, it's different. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, well, you're a real survivor. You, you went through surgeries. You had shrapnel in your body. I just lived through the experience. And Sari stopped me dead in my tracks that day. And she said, I, I don't want to ever hear those words come out of your mouth. And I think it's the first time that I really took a breath. And I was like, this was real. This was real and I lived through it and it's had a long lasting impact on my life and my children. Um, <laughs> trips to Disney are something that we have to plan in the mindset where, you know, you think of Disney as, as wonderful and beautiful and magical and there's fireworks at night. But did you know that Disney shoots off air cannons during the day? And if you don't know that, that could send you into a, a tailspin. Um, so I, I was sitting in a restaurant recently with some friends of mine from 20 years ago who had come to visit from Israel and we were in Hollywood, Florida and something dropped and three of us at the table got up and she looked at me and she said to me, you're living with it. I said, what do you mean? She said, I didn't realize 20 years ago what we were living with, but I realize now how many of us are living with it. And that's the long term effects of living with terrorism. Well, thank you for sharing, Nahama, because I think it's incredibly powerful to hear each speaker share how much that even if they weren't physically hurt, that their soul was hurt and that it actually takes time to come to terms with that. So you're highlighting a very important angle. And I think there's many trauma people who have suffered from traumas that it's like the hidden trauma. And I appreciate the fact that you're speaking out about it. And I'm so glad that you recognize that you are living with it and you are a victim just because you didn't have shrapnel in your body. And the fact that going to Disney can trigger off something. And I saw this, you know, we were recently in Nepal um, for Pesach and we were like 400 um, post army soldiers in the Samuels family and that night, though, in the, the, the air conditioning system in Nepal was they took, they had like a Shabbat guy throw cold water on the tin roof. And as soon as the water went, t -t 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 -t, everyone jumped. There was like collective post traumatic stress in the room because these people are all coming out of, you know, being soldiers. And um, I guess, you know, the sound of something that sounds like gunfire has like a a, a reaction so I can't imagine living with that for like 20 years and then my, it was... my son turned to me when we were in Disney and he looked at me and he saw all of a sudden my face went white and he's like mommy we're in Disney <laughs> we're not there and I was like oh man even my kids are recognizing that I'm there sometimes it uh yeah you know I think it's so important that we all understand this and realize and you know, you were obviously incredibly lucky because you did survive, but survive comes with a label. And that means survive means that it comes with whatever that package is, whether it's physical or emotional. Um, and to Sari for being that powerhouse that always gives people perspective on the situation. <laughs> um, I also want to say, we often say that we, we need to not only survive, but thrive after something like this. And I think that Nahama gives a, 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 a point that just because you don't have any physical injuries, you can still survive a terrorist attack and have the long-term psychological impact. And as you've heard from the first few speakers, no one story is the same. And while there may be similarities, everybody's perspective and everybody's take on things has a little bit of a different 
um, way of dealing and a way of coping with what's happened to them. And I think that's just really important. And I know how hard it is for you to share. And, and I think that uh, your kids are way smarter than most kids their age. And uh, they, they really understand that you give them the opportunities also to learn from your experience and give back. And it's not only that Nahum is involved in all these things, her kids are involved in, in doing stuff in the community. It's really a role model to her children um, that she really embodies this person that just constantly is looking for ways not only to give back, but to also give thank you to the first responders that often um, are not given enough credit for, for saving lives in any type of emergency situation.